Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. I'm your host, Harry Simiou, and this is episode 24, brought to you by Loserpool.com. On this week's show, we'll be reflecting on the win over Cardiff City. I'll be going through the player ratings, or our player ratings, with Chris Davison. Later on, I'll be talking to Dave Seeger, my colleague on Love Sport Radio and one of the best Arsenal writers out there. And following that, I'll be having a good old-fashioned debate with radio producer Mike Stavrou in regards to a few issues that have been uh, coming up amongst Arsenal fans in the last few weeks. Right, before we get Chris on the line, I'm going to share my player ratings after the 3-2 victory at the Cardiff City Stadium. Defence looked shaky as usual, no excuses there. Um, It is a real concern for me, it is something that doesn't seem to be improving from week to week. As an attacking threat, at times we looked brilliant, but at times we looked void of ideas again. So, um, I don't know, I don't think all that much has changed from... Uh, the West Ham game to this week, I think it's pretty much service as usual and, and as you were. Starting with Petr Cech in goal, I'm going to give him a 5 out of 10. I still think he looks terribly uncomfortable with the ball at his feet. And I understand that he's following Emery's instructions. But I can't help but feel that a player of his experience should just apply some common sense and do the right thing. You know, that ball that he gave straight to Harry Arter, had that been a half-decent player, that would have been in the back of our net. It's concerning, you know, I get it. There are instructions in place and I get that you want to do what your manager's asking of you. But surely at some point as a 36-year-old or whatever he is, goalkeeper, with that much experience, you should be able to make the call. You should know when going short is just simply not an option and and go long. Hector Bellerin at right back. I'm going to give him six and a half out of 10. Again, he provided us with plenty of width on that right-hand side. He got up more than he got down, I suppose, but he still got exposed defensively uh, from time to time. The thing is, though, you you can't overlook the fact that he just has no support on that right-hand side. None at all. Mesut Ozil was supposedly playing out there on on Sunday, and he was nowhere to be seen when Cardiff were attacking, and often they were doubling up on that side, Junior Hoylet and the fullback getting forward and giving Bellerin all sorts of problems. I just think Emery needs to find another way of dealing with it, and and that could be uh, through asking the defensive midfielders to tuck in when Bellerin goes forward or I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the solution is. If if I knew, then maybe I'd, I'd be the right candidate for the Arsenal job. That was my phone there. Forgot to put it on silent. Uh, five minutes on the naughty step, I think. Yep. Shkod Ran Mustafi, um, always a divisive figure. Now I'm going to give him seven and I am being generous. I know that I'm being generous, uh, but I think he was a constant threat from set pieces on Sunday. He came close to scoring shortly before he actually did. And when he did, my word, what a brilliant header. He Great movement in the box, got himself on the end of it and literally used the power on the cross to just divert it into that top corner. And even if Cardiff had a player on the line, he wasn't stopping that, no chance. Uh, so brilliant goal from Mustafi. Other than that, I don't think he had a great game. I don't think anyone had a great game, apart from maybe one player who I'm going to mention later on. But yeah, I think a seven is fair, probably a little bit generous. Now on to his defensive partner, Sogradis. I think he'd done some good things in patches. But much like Czech, he just looks so very uncomfortable with the ball at his feet. I'm struggling to warm to this player at the moment. Um, I think he's an okay defender. Um, He's a bit of a brute. He's a bit of a lump. And I think he can do a job. But I don't think he's top quality. And personally, I think you'll only go so far uh, by signing players of that sort of mid level of capability that mid-level of class and and that's what he is I'm sorry to say it but that is what he is and 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 we should just understand that now 
Nacho Monreal at left back. Uh, I think it was an average game from Nacho's point of view. He's certainly more balanced in his play than Hector Bellerin is, but I think that's down to the manager's instructions. I think he's told to be a little bit more conservative, um, knowing that, that Bellerin is the one that Emery really wants to see getting forward and, and trying to unlock teams that way. So six out of five, uh, sorry, 6.5, I should say, out of 10 for Nacho Monreal. Socrates with a six. So uh, I think I'm being quite generous in my ratings today. I must be in a good mood. Moving into the midfield, Granite Xhaka. Now, knives were out again for him. He gave away a poor pass, which led to Cardiff's equaliser. It was a stupid pass. No defending it. Uh, but his part in the way we build up play is key. Whether his haters agree or not, I don't know. But I feel quite strongly about this. And I'd go as far as saying... If you can't see the part that Granit Xhaka plays in Arsenal's build-up play, then you don't know what you're watching. I think his his delivery for Mustafi's goal was fantastic, a brilliant cross, the kind of corner we've been crying out for for years. So I'm going to give Xhaka a six on that basis, an assist, uh, a pretty decent performance apart from one poor pass. Petr Cech gave away a poor pass, which he put in Pariata's path. And, and that could have led to a goal. In fact, that was a worse pass. But I don't see people jumping on social media and criticizing Petr Cech as much as they have Granit Xhaka. So I think people need to put their knives away, calm down a little bit. And I'm giving Granit Xhaka a 6 out of 10. Matteo Guendouzi. Now, I thought he played okay yesterday, but his level was certainly dropped um, since the Chelsea game, I feel anyway. I think in the last couple of games, he struggled for some consistency, but that's okay. He's young, relatively inexperienced, and consistency is the hardest thing to find as a young player. So I I'm not too worried. I, I, I don't think there's anything to panic about, but his performance is against Cardiff and West Ham only strengthened the point I made a couple of weeks ago. He should be taken out of the firing line and replaced by Lucas Torreira now. Um, you know, Guendouzi's got plenty of time ahead of him. There's plenty of Europa League games and domestic cup fixtures he can play a part in. I just think right now he's he's not ready and it's uh, time for Lucas Torreira to come in and, and show why we paid all that money for him. So he gets a six from me, Matteo Guendouzi. Oh, six is all round today. Uh, another player who earned the six on my player ratings was Aaron Ramsey. Thought he worked extremely hard, covered an awful lot of ground, but it wasn't his best performance in terms of productivity by any means. He's a vital part of our injury room, and I guess Sunday just wasn't his day. Uh, no biggie. Moving on to another six, Mesa Ozil. Another player who had an off day. Just looks low on confidence at the moment. Looks a bit lost in Emery's system. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how his season goes because right now it's, it's not looking great. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Now, he scored a fantastic goal. There's no denying that. It was a brilliant goal, brilliant piece of link-up play with Alex Lacazette, who I'm going to come on to shortly. But I thought that uh, Aubameyang looked pretty ineffective for large parts out on that left-hand side. I've said it every time he's played there. I just don't like it. I just don't like... The idea of having one of Europe's top centre forwards playing out wide, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to give him a seven because I thought that was a fantastic goal. Great finish. I just opened his body up and, and placed it into that corner, leaving Etheridge with no chance at all. However, I don't think it was his best game. I don't think we utilised Aubameyang as well as we could have. And, and so I'm going to give him... I'm going to have to go with a seven, I think. Seven is fair. Fair? Agree? Disagree? Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Now, moving on to the man of the match, and no doubt about it, he was the man of the match. He was Arsenal's standout player by a country mile. Alexander Lacazette, he's going to get a 9 out of 10 for me uh, based on, on Sunday's performance. His link-up play was fantastic. Um, always alert, always willing to play with his back to goal and, and bring others into the game just as he did for the Aubameyang goal. He was very unfortunate not to have scored uh, in the first half when he hit the foot of the post with an excellent strike. Um, but of course, the most important thing was was the winner that he grabbed uh, towards the end of the game. A fantastic finish. He took the ball on the turn and absolutely smashed it past the goalkeeper. And that was unsavable, you know, power high into the roof of the net. 
brilliant, brilliant piece of uh, striking play. And, and he looks like he's found his confidence. He looks happy playing alongside the Bamiyang. Um, but I'm still not sure that you can play both of them in that way. I just think that if you're going to play both of them, maybe you need to play them as an out and out front too. Having a Bamiyang on the left is a waste in my opinion. But Alex Lacazette, fantastic, brilliant performance. Man of the match by a country mile. It would also be wrong of me not to mention Lucas Torreira's contribution. I thought when he came on, he was excellent. He was sharp. He looked a lot sharper than he has done in, in the first few games, albeit he's been coming on as a substitute. I thought he looked pretty good against West Ham. He seemed to continue that um, on Sunday when he sort of brought some life to our midfield, was a bit more, uh, what's the word, positive in his passing than, say, Matteo Guendouzi was prior to him coming off. So, yeah, I, I thought Torreira made a positive impact, and I think he's shown enough now to, to warrant a starting place. I think, I've said it already, I think he should replace Matteo Guendouzi for the game up at Newcastle. Um, and, you know, he's, he looks like he's back to full fitness now, and it's time that we saw... The, the best of Lucas Torreira, the man that we went out and spent a significant chunk of our transfer budget on. OK, I'm going to take a short break. And when I return, we'll be going through Chris Davison's player ratings, seeing how they compare to mine and uh, getting his thoughts on the overall performance on Sunday. The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18 is now on sale. The Chronicles of Aguna tells the story of Arsenal's final season through a supporter's eyes, attempts to shed light on some of the season's major talking points and features exclusive interviews with Ray Parler, Kevin Campbell, Tom Watt and Robbie Lyle. Available to order now from Amazon, Waterstones and all major bookstores, The Chronicles of Aguna 2017-18. Order your copy now by clicking the link in the description. I'm joined on the line by football reporter Chris Davison. Chris, welcome back to the show. How are you, mate? Uh, hi, Harry. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Um, also good to be back on the show, as always. Good stuff, good stuff. I'm good, thanks, mate. Uh, glad we got a, a second win on the bounce in the bag. 3-2 victory up at Cardiff, but we didn't make it easy for ourselves. Chris, what did you make of the overall performance from Arsenal? Uh, yeah, well, obviously, like you said, happy we got the three points um first of all but like you also mentioned uh we didn't make it make it easy for ourselves at all and um, well, I was sort of expecting that you know I'm you know we're, we're still not in the perfect shape yet um you know you know on with the organization on the field and obviously in form obviously when he got the one one win um apart from yesterday against West Ham so you know it's obviously a lot of work to do so I think it was always going to be a bit um a sort of a game with ups and downs um, but um, yeah, just overall happy to get the three points. That's what matters, isn't it? At the end of the day, the rest of it is a is a sideshow. It's all about the result. It is a results business. Chris, I'm going to run through the team and get your player ratings. I've just given mine, uh, so I'll be interested to hear yours and, and compare them. <laughs> so uh, starting with Petr Cech, what would you have given his performance out of 10? Oh, um I've done a little bit of thinking about this because you know overall preseason, well, you know last four games, he's 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 actually not done too badly, um, and he's put in some you know um, good performances in goal. But yesterday, Czech gave me quite a few mini heart attacks. Harry, to be fair, you know, is he was he looked so unsettled on the ball, um, very shaky at times, and I you know honestly we were lucky not to get a card of forward um I honestly think you know we think we were lucky in that respect to get away with it so he, to, with his performance yesterday I'm going to give him a four because I just think he was honestly so shaky um he didn't get what well, you know he made one or two saves simple saves but obviously conceded a couple um and obviously apart from that there wasn't a lot for him to do but when he was on the ball um and when he was trying to look out for you know look out for a, a part or even field as he looked very shaky and like I said we could have eaten, you know due to one of his own mistakes I'm going to give him a four uh, but, but I do understand you know he's going to take a little bit of time to get used to this new system of playing out from the back yep fair enough fair enough I gave him a five myself so you're not too far off um, Hector <laughs> Bellerin 
Um, I'm going to give him a six. You know, he played quite a you know sort of comfortable game yesterday. Um, nothing too too spectacular. Um, it's also the same for Monreal. To be fair, both sixes for for the fullbacks. Um, they looked good going forward at times. Um, you know, Monreal done well a few times going forward. Um, looked dangerous at times, um, but you know nothing spectacular from either. Um, quite a calm game from them. So um, I'll give them a six. Okay, what about Shkodran Mustafi? Mustafi, um, I think he was actually quite solid yesterday, to be fair. Um, I know we can see the uh, two, but overall, I thought Mustafi had a good performance. Obviously, cracking header um, for the first goal, um, done really well. And also, not, not just from that first goal, but he looked quite dangerous from the set pieces. He, he could have easily got another one. He um, was always attacking the ball when it came, came into the box. So, um, overall, and obviously with the goal, um, I'll give him a seven. Lovely. What about Socrates, Sogradis Pavastathopoulos? The uh, big Greek brick wall. <laughs> what did you give him? Yeah. Um, I'll give him a six point five. Again, I think he had quite a, a decent game. Um, I think he's he's been doing all right. To be fair, this season so far, um, like we said on the podcast um, a week or two ago, Harry, um, he, you know he's a no nonsense defender, brick wall as you describe him, and he, he showed that again yesterday. Um, always, always getting getting right stuck in. Um, so six point five for me. Okay, Granite Xhaka. Um, Xhaka, again, it was a difficult one to call because, he, yes, he did make that, that costly mistake which led to Cardiff second. But apart from that, I must admit, um, he'd he done all right. Um, I'm still, he's still got a lot to do to, to uh, impress me, um, Xhaka. Um, but um, overall, I think he'd done, he done, he done okay. So I'll, I'll give him a six. You know, he's, again, we've, we've talked about it before. His, his range of passing and his, um, you know, his ability of creating chances was, was evident again yesterday. Um, so I'll give him a six. Okay, Gwen Doozy. Gwen Doozy, um, again, a six for me. Um, you know, he, he's been doing what he's, he's done pretty much um, for the last f- f- three games. Um, calm on the ball, um, getting stuck in, um, always wanting the ball as well um, and, and looking up to play, to play people um, around the pitch, um, always looking for the ball. Um, and, yeah, just, just moving forward, you know, he's a quite a positive player on the ball. He likes to get forward, likes to pick out lots of passes, moving forward as well. Um, so I'll give him a six. It was quite a, you know, a relative calm and um, tidy performance from him yesterday. Okay, Aaron Ramsey. Aaron Ramsey, I thought was was good yesterday, Harry. Um, you know, his work rate was was very clear to say he worked very hard. Um, maybe overdone it at times, but um, still, you know, his work rate was really important for us yesterday. Um, kept us kept us going, um, and it was always looking to get on the ball. Uh, and create chances. So I'm going to give him a seven. Okay, Mesut Ozil. Um, Mesut Ozil, um, oh, that's a tough one. I mean, you know, he, he didn't have a great first half, but second half was a little bit better. Um, I'll give him a six. Okay, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang. Um, great goal from Aubameyang yesterday. A lovely finish from out, just outside the box. Um, again, he was a little bit quiet second half. He grew into the game as it went on, though. I'll give him a 7.5. Okay, Alexander Lacazette. Uh, Lacazette, man of the match on the day, and I would have given him it anyway. He was fantastic yesterday. Um, brilliant build-up play, you know, holding the ball up for for more for more people to get involved, like he always does. It's one of his strengths. Um, lovely little flick-ons at times as well to keep the the movement going forward, um, looking dangerous as well, and obviously cracking cracking goal uh, to get the winner. Um, to get the win, sorry. Um, it was a great finish, absolute rock of a shot. He was also lucky not to, unlucky, sorry, not to get a second when he hit the post earlier on in the second half. So I'm going to give Laka a nine. Okay. And uh, I know he didn't play for the whole game, but what did you make of Lucas Torreira's performance when he came on? Uh, I think Torreira, you know, had a really positive impact on the game, Harry. Not for the first time either. I think he's done all right when he's come off the bench. Um, in the previous few games as well. So I gave Torreira a seven, um, obviously a, a good little pass to Laka um, for, for, the, for the winning goal. Um, and, you know, I think he had 100% pass completion, you know, he really tidy on the ball, comfortable. He kept it, kept it nice and calm. Um, and obviously he's as well got the assist, so I've given him a seven. 
Okay. And Chris, just before I let you go, I wanted to ask you uh, about the Alex Iwobi thing. You know, there's rumors that he's fallen out with Unai Emery in training <laughs> and hence his omission from the squad. Is there any truth in that or is it just speculation? Or are we just, as Arsenal fans, just so eager to say that someone's fallen out with a manager when <laughs> in actual fact they've just got a cold? Nah, the, the absolute rubbish if anyone's saying that um, seriously about the falling out of Emery. I put a tweet on yesterday um, saying that it, uh, there's apparently been reports about a word be falling out with Emery, um, but I was, I was just being sarcastic um, because it's, it's been funny over the last couple of weeks, you know, listening to these different reports um, about what was, you know, where it was Ozil all before. Um, so um, I think, uh, well, I'm definitely going to take Emery's word for it and um, say uh, a Wobi was ill. Uh, um, and um, I also believe Emery, uh, Arsenal's manager, uh, who knows which, everything that's going on. Um, I will also believe him on the uh, Meza Ozil case as well. You know, I think it was just... Um, yeah. We've said in the past with the media, Arsenal have been a, a very easy target, um, you know, to well, you criticise and to make up rumours. Um, so I think, um, you know, uh, I'll believe Emery until something concrete maybe comes out um, in the future, if anything was to happen in the training ground. Yeah, no, I totally agree, Chris. Totally agree. Chris, thank you very much for joining me once again. Do you want to remind our listeners of how they can find you on social media? Yeah, cheers, Harry. Always um, good to be on the podcast. My Twitter handle is cdavison underscore afc. Lovely, Chris. Thank you very much, and we'll no doubt speak very, very soon. Cheers, Harry. All the best. We're going to take another short break, and when we return, I'll be joined by my Love Sport Radio colleague, Dave Seeger. Enjoying what you've heard so far? If so, make sure you hit that subscribe button and leave us a review on iTunes. Joining me on the line is my Love Sport Radio colleague, Dave Seeger. Dave, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, mate. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure, pleasure to be asked. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. <laughs> Dave, what did you make of, of Sunday's performance? A 3-2 victory in the end. We didn't make easy work of it, as usual, when it comes to Arsenal. But what were your thoughts of our overall performance? Overall, uh, overall encouraged. Um, bit, a little bit surprised. Um, I wasn't surprised to see Lacazette starting, and I was uh, very pleased that he did. I was a little bit surprised, probably like most of us, not to see Lucas Torreira get a start in that game. Um, I thought he would. Um, otherwise, you're pleased to see Ozil back. Um, interesting, interesting selection in that it wasn't quite clear to me before the game how it was going to be set up, and. Having watched the whole game, I'm still not quite sure. Uh, it was very fluid, wasn't it? So, uh, but all in all, yeah, very, uh, very encouraged. Not so much with the defensive side, obviously, but uh, encouraged that you know I think uh, bounce back ability is probably the, the expression. Um, you know, I never felt at any point, even when they equalised, I didn't feel like we weren't going to win the game, which I guess is a, is, a, is an encouraging feeling to have watching the Arsenal. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Dave, what did you make of Granite Xhaka's performance? Because he's come in for a lot of criticism once again, um, this time because his misplaced pass eventually led to Cardiff's uh, initial equaliser. What did you make of his overall performance? And, and is it time that he was dropped from the side, in your opinion? Well, dropped, is, dropped is a hard expression, isn't it, these days with, with squad rotation. Um, rotation. I... I certainly wouldn't. I didn't. I wouldn't judge his overall performance on that pass. Although you know, inexplicable would be the word that springs to mind. Given, given his main attribute is his passing to to pick out to pick out the opposition player from that position. You know why he felt the need to be playing the, the crossfield pass like that when there was a simple pass or two on. I don't know, but I wouldn't judge him on that. And of course, the, those who support him will will point to the pass completions and the stats and and, and the sort of pre chances created. You know, I'd rather just watch 90 minutes, you know, with my eye. And um, he, had, he had an OK game, um, but I, I wasn't massively impressed. Uh, I, I would find it hard, you know, push come to shove, to, to sort of criticise him and say he should be dropped on that one performance. But it's more a case of whether he fits into the grand scheme of things long term for me. I just think if he wants to play the most attacking players he has, and they are his best players... If he wants to fit them all in, I think shuffling the pack may mean ultimately that, that he may miss out. But time will tell. I certainly wouldn't judge him uh, based on that one bad pass, though. I think he had an OK game, um, but he didn't have any, any better a game than Gwenduzi, for example. 
Okay. In my opinion. What did you make of uh, Lucas Torreira when he came on the pitch? A lot of people have, have been talking highly of him and it looked as well, though... Well, I he... tweeted almost as soon as he came on, within five or ten minutes. I, I, and I, I, I pinned the tweet because, you know, I felt quite strongly. Um, it was a case of, with Torreira, every second touch is a pass. Uh, it's a case of, and that to me is a sign of a quality player. The first touch is, you know, well, I'm, I'm bringing it under control, but he's already thinking what he's going to do. And invariably, the second touch is a forward pass. And for a player that is ostensibly, you know, uh, supposed to be our, our most deep lying defensive midfield player, I think that's very, very encouraging. Uh, he, he doesn't look to pass it sideways. He always looks to pass it forward. And, you know, uh, he, he had some very, very telling contributions. I, I'm very admirable. I'm, I'm admiring his, you know, apparent patience and, and a willingness to sort of come on and play with such enthusiasm. Because arriving with such a fee, you know, undoubtedly, in my opinion, the most important signing we made of the of the five. You know, he's, he's shown a lot of patience not to be playing. I'm absolutely certain he will be playing a, a great part, you know, for the rest of the season. Uh, very similar to what Wenger did with Shaka in the first season. He eased him in gradually, but I think. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's going to be too long to, sort of, till we see Torreira sort of starting and playing 90 minutes for us. I think he's a fabulous footballer. Yeah. Dave, what did you make of, of the, the way we're trying to play out from the back? I know we've spoken about this on, on Love Sport a couple of times. Yeah. What are your feelings on it? Because it seems to me at the moment that it's bringing more danger than yeah. it is benefit. So uh, what are your overall thoughts on that? Do you think it's time that Unai just says... Let's just play it safe and and you know try and play it long and get ourselves out of trouble. Well, he's obviously not going to do that, or as he would have done it already. I mean, there's two things here. Firstly, he's obviously if he decides ultimately, having given Czech a chance, that Czech can't do it, then he has to try Leno. Um, and I'm not sure. Well, he could wait till the Caribou Cup on the 26th, where when he's obviously going to play. Um, and you know Brentford are a good passing a passing team, but they're a good high pressing side. So you know he will be put under pressure. So he could wait till then. But I would rather he started before. I don't blame. Ultimately, um, I think it's too late for Czech to change. You know the way he's played football the whole of his career. Uh, I do. I do think Mustafi and, and Socrates are occasionally putting the ball in the wrong place for him. And, and so it's, it's, not, it's not just Czech that needs to improve. I think all three of them need to improve. You know, and, and I guess you just have to manage the game on the pitch. You know, these are very experienced footballers, the three of them. Uh, I mean, Mustafi's a World Cup winner and he's the least experienced of the three. You know, I don't think Emery's going to sort of have a go at them at half-time if they've made a decision on occasion they need to pass it long. <laughs> uh, you know, so I think there has to be some game, man- game management by senior players. But then you see Czech you know, making the misplaced pass and, and Emery's giving him the thumbs up every time. So it, it's a difficult one for the players, but I just, I would just like to think that they'll, they'll show a bit more, you know, managing the game on the pitch and, and not making the backward pass, you know, when it's not required and when it's, when it's not the right thing to do. So I, you know, so a long answer to a short question, but personally, I'm sure like most Arsenal fans, we're all keen to see what Leno can do. Yeah. Um, you yeah. Know, because obviously that's why he was bought. One, I have to, one has to assume. Of course. And and just finally, um, since Unai Emery has come in, have you seen any improvements? And if so, what, what would you say they are? Crikey. Uh, I just think it's very early. Um, it's very early to, 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 to you know, make, it, make um, sweeping statements or, or, or overall assessments. But um, I think the energy levels, um, the, the ability to press in numbers... Um, we 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 saw we saw it once in a blue moon under Wenger, and when we did see it, it was in a game when we thought oh, this is so effective they're pressing really well, but it would last for five or ten minutes, and then they would lapse into old habits. Uh, I think what we are seeing is 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 an improved level of pressing across the pitch. Um, you know, certainly by the midfield and, and the advanced players. I think Lacazette was just absolutely magnificent on Sunday. Um, I think uh, the thing that's gone that hasn't changed, uh, and I think has to change, is, is the is the balance in the fullbacks, which also we discussed on the on the radio show. I just think, you know, whilst whilst we're playing quite narrowly and we need the fullbacks for whip, uh, I don't think we need two fullbacks for whip. You know, in every attack, I think they just need to show a bit of caution. So that that definitely hasn't changed from Wenger's era, uh, and I think it's going to have to if he wants to play the way he wants to play. I think he's going. I think he's going to have to 
you know, had a little bit of caution there. But uh, overall, you know, there's a lot of encouraging signs. We're scoring, we're scoring well. We're creating well. We've got lots of op- options in attack, some of which, you know, combinations we haven't even seen yet. Um, for example, you know, we, we, we were finishing the back end of last season with, with Mkhitaryan and Ozil, you know, um, Aubameyang and Lekaset on the pitch, which we've barely seen this season. So, you know, that that's still to be seen. We play quite narrow. It's almost sort of four... 2-2-2 two, two, two at the weekend and, and Ramsey you know Ozil and Mkhitaryan can play in those roles so it's going to be interesting to see but overall encouraging signs but too early to make a, an overall assessment I would say at this stage Yep lovely Dave thank you so much I know you're eager to get off to the gym um, do you want to just <laughs> tell our listeners how they can follow you on social media and uh, uh, Yeah um, uh, still uh, always been the same for, for, since 2011 it's uh, Dave 66 and uh, I am the co-owner of uh, the Gunnerstown blog where we have a lot of very talented writers of which I am one but certainly not the most talented uh, who write regularly on, on, on Arsenal matters most days so Brilliant. thanks for that Brilliant. And you can catch myself and Dave on the A Little Bit Arsenal show on Love Sport Radio on Wednesday nights between 7 yeah. and 8. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping on the subject of that, just going back to that goalkeeper situation, I'm talking privately at the moment to John Lukic, and I don't know if it'll be this Wednesday, but John Lukic is definitely going to come on the show. So it'll be fascinating to hear what he's got to say uh, about the goalkeeper situation. Fantastic. And we must shout out to, to Giles and Chris as well. Uh, let's not forget <laughs> Dave thank you once again thank you very right. much for joining me thanks Harry cheers. I'll see you Wednesday mate cheers bye bye cheers bye that was my colleague from Love Sport Radio Dave Seeger uh, one of the other co-hosts on the A Little Bit Arsenal show Wednesday nights 7 to 8.30 p.m. shout out to the rest of the boys as well Chris and Giles I'm going to take another short break. It's the last one, I promise. And when I return, I'll be talking to another gentleman from Love Sport Radio. This time it's producer Mike Stavrou, a massive Arsenal fan. Joining me now on the line is Love Sport Radio producer. It's Mike Stavrou. Mike, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, making your debut. How are you? Good evening, Harry. I'm very, very happy to be here. I finally get to get to meet, not in person, uh, the the velvet man that is Harry Simi. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we always miss each other, don't we, in the studio? We do, it yeah. No, I haven't actually, I haven't met you in real life yet, but I've heard your voice so many times. I feel like I know you, but but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might regret knowing me, mate. Don't worry about that. <laughs> right. So, Mike, you know, we've had a few debates back and forwards on Twitter, and and you, anyone that knows me, knows that I absolutely love a bit of debate. It, it makes me, you know, it's my thing. I love it. I enjoy it. It gets me going, um, Mike. As for yourself, you know, you've got very differing opinions to me on a certain midfielder at Arsenal at the moment, and that's Granit Xhaka. Now, what is your issue with Granit Xhaka? Why do you think he should be dropped from the team? And uh, just go on a little rant for me, mate. <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> Where to start? There's there's so many things. And uh, the the number one, I think my main gripe with him is that uh, I don't know what he is and I don't know what exactly he does and what exactly he's good at. Because I read uh, an interview with him a while ago and he described himself as a false 10. And that, that to me, false 10, that I was like, what on earth? Like, are you a defense midfielder? Are you central midfielder? Do you want to be an attacking midfielder? And the fact that he doesn't really know, and I feel like no one really knows what his best position is, it means that he he's, he's not he's not understood and what his real qualities are. And I was just looking through some stats because I know that, um, that you love stats, Harry, talking about his, uh, his passing statistics. So they're, they're so great, right? But I, I want to talk <laughs> about some negative stats. Uh, so this, this is going back to last season. Um, start with, with passing. So that I read an article in, in like November time and this was only you know, a couple of months into the season and he'd already misplaced 153 passes. And, you know, for a player like that, where it's so pivotal that he, you know, c- collects the ball, especially in this Emery system, he collects the ball uh, from the keeper or the centre backs, and then he distributes it. For him to actually misplace that amount of passes, it, it does, you know, it does scare me. And just, um, just talking about defensive responsibility as well, there's been so many moments of, you know, last year um, and and this game against Cardiff where he's uh, he's, he's he's been tackled uh, off the ball or a misplaced pass and. It's just, it's, it's a liability, Harry, for me, ultimately. 
Wow, Mike's come prepared with his statistics. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the thing is for me with Granit Xhaka is that he is so pivotal in our build-up play. I think he's the only player that does, as you mentioned, go and get the ball off the centre-halves, go and get the ball off the keeper and start moves off. Do I think he's the best in the world in that position? No. Do I think he's the best in the Premier League? No. But what I will say is he's the best at Arsenal in doing that. And that's the thing, you know, we can only work with what we've got. And at this moment in time, for me, Granit Xhaka has to play. Now, he took a lot of criticism again this weekend when his misplaced pass led to Cardiff's first equaliser. Well, the thing is for me, you know, he's playing a ball across the pitch. Cardiff have won the ball back almost on the halfway line. They've broken forward. The cross has come in. It's not been dealt with. The re- deflection's fallen to the forward who's blasted it into the back of the net. And just for me, we need to be a bit careful here because I feel as though we're, we're pointing the finger at certain players far too much. We're damaging their confidence If they weren't doing what Emery was asking of them, they wouldn't be in the team. It's as simple as that. We've seen that he's willing to drop players. And I think Granit Xhaka, Hector Bellerin and and Petr Cech to some degree, and even Mesa Ozil actually, are four players that the fans just love to get onto. And, you know, that's my only thing. I, I don't think he's as bad as people make out. Do I think he's great? Do I think he's fantastic? No. But based on what we've got, unless Torreira shows that he can do that role, which in in all fairness, we haven't seen enough of him yet to make that call. Then I think Granit Xhaka is the best option still in, in there. And so for me, it's Xhaka and Torreira. That would be my starting midfield. Mike, what would be your starting midfield pairing if, if it was down to you? Uh, so I have given it a thought. And although I do really love uh, Matteo Guendouzi and I love his passion and desire and I love how he he hunts the ball down and he he did have uh, really, really two good opening games against City and Chelsea. He has tailed off against, against West Ham and Cardiff. I, I agree with you on that, but um, as well, I don't think that he can start every game. He's only 19. He's got, he's got a long way to go. So for me with, with Xhaka, I, I know what you're saying. I know that, that you don't think he is necessarily the big problem, but for me, it's just, you know, the, the chances given away and not even that just just defensively um you know not following his man harry how many times did we see a last season where you know he's he's made a rash tackle and then not got back into position and we've conceded i mean i saw it against united last season against swansea last season and the only thing i will say that for me the, the only way that shaka can play in this team is if Torreira takes that defensive midfield role and and Emery says to Xhaka, all right, Xhaka, just play a bit more forward. You won't have that much defensive responsibility. For me, that's the only way that he can get into the team. But you, you know what? I would, I would even throw a spanner into the works of the, you know, like the template team that we go for. And I would say that if Torreira was very disciplined, we could even get away with someone like Ramsey in the pivot next to him, which allows Ozil to play as well. I don't know if, if Ramsey has got that defensive responsibility in him to play that second role, but you know, it, it could work. He, he needs to ultimately try it and see what works best. Yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's about trial and error at the moment, isn't it? And I, I take your point regarding Granit Xhaka not tracking his man back. A game at Watford last season comes to mind. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, anyway. But yeah, totally agree. You know, th- there is plenty of trial and error to be to be done at the Emirates. And, and we're going to see plenty of different combinations throughout the season, I'm sure. And, and I guess it's going to take time for Unai Emery to decide 100% on who his midfield pair will be. Now, another player who's been dividing opinion of late is Hector Bellerin. Plenty of people saying that he's regressed and I've said it in the past on this podcast and I still I still maintain that. I think Hector Bellerin in terms of his overall play has regressed. But I also think that Hector Bellerin is only doing what his manager is asking him to do at the moment and that's to bomb forward and provide us with width. Mike, I know you've got some issues with the way he's been defending it, but let's be clear, it's not about him getting forward, is it? You're more annoyed about the way he actually defends when he is in a defensive position. Um, so I do take your point, and I think that you're right, he is doing what, what Emery is asking him to do, which is bomb on. And the, the big issue that Arsenal have is that when the fullbacks do bomb on, the, the, the whole job of the cent- the defensive midfielders is to is to actually cover for them. And they're not doing that. I'm going to have a go at Xhaka again. But, you know, his, his job should be, if, if Monreal does bomb on, to, to cover for him. But he's not got the awareness and not quite got the speed to do that. And whoever we've been playing next to him hasn't been doing that for, for Bellerin. But um, 
in, in terms of Bellerin, I think he's okay going forward. Harry's point of view, I don't think he's exceptional. He's, his delivery is okay. Um, for me, like he, w- when he's running back, he seems to have lost his pace. And I know you, you, you said to me on Twitter the other day, there's no way he can have lost his pace. But watching like some earlier clips when he first broke into the team, he was rapid. And I've seen him recently, and whether he's not trying or he, he gets skinned so easily. I mean, the other day against Cardiff, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was one of the goals or one of the chances, but Joe Bennett on the left-hand side, who, let's be honest, he's not, he's not leading our message, Joe Bennett for Cardiff. <laughs> he's, he's literally just shifted the ball to the left. And Bellerin tried to jockey him, and he's just beating him so easily, Harry. And I think that like his one-on-one defending is is not good enough, really. And you know we've got a player on the bench, Lich Steiner, who's won seven league titles with Juventus, hundred caps for Switzerland. And I think in the in the big games, Lich Steiner should play against the smaller teams. We might be able to get away with a bit of Bellerin, but for me, I'll play Lich Steiner in the big games. Okay, interesting. At this moment in time, I would leave it as it is, and I just think that. That's because Hector Bellerin is the only width that we seem to have in our entire team at the moment. And I'd question whether Licksteiner at 34 years old has the ability to get up and down the way Bellerin does. I don't think there's any question about the fact that he's a better defender. I think that's clear as day. I think everyone knows that. Yeah. I just think that maybe Unai Emery needs to find a way of plugging the gap that Bellerin leaves, perhaps by making sure one of his defensive midfield players slots into that position, whether he asks Torreira, for example, to slot into the defence and it becomes a back three with Mustafi and uh, uh, Socrates spreading out. I don't know. There's plenty of things that Emery can do. I just think he needs to, to work that out. because. But in terms of his, of his one-on-one defending, Harry, do, do you think he's good enough? To play for Arsenal. I don't think he's ever been particularly strong in that department. I think he's always relied on his pace to get him out of trouble. I think what we're seeing now under Unai Emery is he's being asked to to get a lot narrower with the centre-backs. And then what happens is, you know, a player receives the ball in a wide position right on the touchline. And then once they've got the ball under control, it becomes a one-on-one situation as opposed to you being able to get out there and get to the ball first. All of a sudden, Bellerin's tucked in. The winger receives the ball on the touchline and he's got time to get it under control. And then you have a one-on-one, which, as you've said, and I, and I agree, Bellerin yeah. is, is, is not very good at. And Bellerin seems to lack the ability to time a tackle. He's not particularly physical. So, yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I get what you're saying. I think his one-on-one defending is weak. And I think where he used to use his pace to get him out of trouble and he used to nip in and make interceptions, I think the way he's being asked to play is, is limiting him there. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I have to, I'm i surprised you agreed with me, Harry Smith. <laughs> we do agree on some things, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, no, we have to agree on something. But... um yeah, I, I I agree with that, and also he he, he needs help because it, especially when you're coming up against great teams who've got attacking fullbacks, you can't leave Bellerin to like you, it doesn't matter who you got right back, you can have the best right back in the world, and they're they're not going to be able to do anything when when they're doubling up like we saw against City when it was uh, Sterling on the left and Mendy, you you got no chance. So I think that that is also more of a systemic thing rather than just Bellerin. I, I mean, I do I do like some elements of Bellerin's game. Do I think he's good enough to play for Arsenal? Probably not. Yeah, fair play. Um, One other position that's up for debate at the moment. A lot of people have been discussing this. Petr Cech, can he play the Emery way? Would you like to see Bernd Leno come in? I would, I would love to see Leno come in. I think it's, it's a really difficult one because obviously we're not Unai Emery. We don't see what happens in training. And obviously Emery's seen Bernd Leno in training and he's not been impressed enough to make him number one. It could be for any amount of reasons. I just think with the, with the way that we are playing out from the back, Czech is a massive, massive problem because um, I saw one of the Cardiff players interviewed uh, after the game and he was saying, yeah, we were targeting Czech because we knew that he wasn't comfortable with the ball at his feet. And if if you're putting that idea into opposition players' heads, Harry, that's that's dangerous because they will see that and they will. Talk. This is Cardiff as well. I keep going back to it. This is a team that are like widely expected to finish bang bottom of the Premier League. So if if teams like that have the confidence to attack us like that, it, it is scary going forward. And I, I just think that um, we'll see Leno in the cups. And if he puts in some good performances, he has to challenge Czech for the number one for me. Yeah. No, don't disagree. At the moment, it's hard to disagree when you see how many defensive issues are being caused by Czech's inability to play from the back and to a degree, our centre-back's inability as well, because 
sometimes when Sogradis in particular receives the ball, he just looks like he doesn't want it. He looks like he's handling it. You're going to try potato. and say second name or you, you're avoiding that Baba one. Baba Stathopoulos. Oh, <laughs> there you okay, go. There, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm Greek, but I, I struggled to say that one as well. So I'll, I'll leave that now. <laughs> I'll let you do that one. That's all right. <laughs> Mike, thank you very, very much for joining me. Do you want to tell our listeners how they can follow you on social media? Yeah, yeah. So um, so I, I'm a producer for Love Sport Radio. You can follow us on that at Love Sport Radio or my own personal account, which is Mike underscore Stavru. Uh, if you're not Greek, uh, it's spelled S-T-A-V-R-O. <laughs> you know what? I have to do that on every podcast I go on. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Mike, you, Mike, thank you very much, and uh, we'll speak again very, very soon. Cheers. That brings us to the end of another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, episode 24, to be precise. My thank you to Chris Davison, Dave Seeger, and Mike Stavrou. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. Subscribe, leave us a review. And of course, don't forget that this podcast is brought to you by loserpool.com. Check them out and hold on to the end of the show for an explanation on what Loserpool is all about. It's a great game. Get involved. My pick last week was Newcastle United. So I'm still in the running. Check it out, guys. Until next week. Ciao. Meet our hero. He's a smart guy who loves sports and loves outwitting other people. Our hero needs to show the world his mastery of the game. Our hero does this by playing games at Loserpool. Our hero is you. Loserpool has two games. In the namesake, the games of an entire season are grouped together into weeks or rounds. After paying an entry fee, you choose one team to lose that week or round. If you're correct, you earn the right to repeat the process in the next round. But the catch is that you cannot choose a team a second time until all the teams have been chosen by you once. If you're knocked out early, you may re-enter the same pool by paying a penalty to make it fair for the other players. Or you may wait until the next pool starts in a few weeks. Raise a pool is similar to lose a pool in that the games of an entire season are grouped together. But in this case, you pay the entry fee and predict the outcome of all the games in that week or round. You will be ranked against all other players according to your accuracy. And at the end of each round, a predetermined percentage of players will be eliminated. There is no option to buy back into a pool if you are eliminated. (laughs) And so you will have to wait until the next pool starts to play again. In both games, the prize money grows very rapidly. The pool is allocated to the last man standing or to add a little drama. To a small surviving group if they vote according to predetermined rules. Loser Pool is about community, friendship, fun and rivalry. Discuss and debate the games and events of the week with players from around the world. Invite your friends and co-workers into your own sub pools and see who can outsmart the group and earn bragging rights. This is your moment. Create an account. Show your sports genius. Be the hero.